Hello everyone, Dr. Naveen here from Met Campus. In this video, we will be discussing in detail the post-exposure profile axis mm -hmm. which is done in a case of HIV. And the reference for this video is uh, NACO 2021 guidelines which are most latest in this regard. Now whenever there is exposure from a source of HIV to the occupational person, it can be any doctor or a nurse in an occupation. So in these cases of exposure, first what we do is we look at the body fluid based on that we assess the risk. There are some body fluids to which the risk is very high. For example, you take blood, semen, vaginal secretions, CSF and other body fluids like synovial fluid, pleural, peritoneal, pericardial fluid exposure and very importantly during the pregnancy and delivery amniotic fluid exposure okay and any other body fluid which is visibly contaminated with the blood so these are scenarios wherein the risk is high not at all risk or negligible risk is associated with secretions like tears sweat urine and feces saliva sputum and vomitus unless and until these secretions contain visible blood there is no risk of transmission of hiv with these body fluids so with this basic knowledge Let's get to this statistical thing that is what is the risk of HIV transmission by different routes. Okay, this is the latest WHO data and the rate is very high almost more than 98% with blood transfusion. It is around 20 to 40% perinatal if there is no intervention like ART prophylaxis. Sexual intercourse depending upon the route of intercourse whether vaginal, anal or oral it, 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 it weighs around 0.1 to 10%. In vaginal, it is 0.05 to 0.1 percent. In anal, it is 0.065 to 0.5 percent. And oral, very negligible, 0.005 to 0.01 percent. And injectable drug usage also carries the risk of HIV transmission, and this risk is around 0.67 percent. And needle stick exposure, which is most common uh, way in interns, so this is 0.3 percent. And mucous membrane splash to eye or oral nostrils area is 0.09 percent secretion now this is all the risk of transmission the statistics are related to hiv at the same time okay parallelly when there is exposure to blood or needle stick injury as an occupational hazard we should also be worried about the transmission of hbv and hcv right so in that sense the risk of HBV transmission after a needle stick is almost 9% to 30% and hepatitis C virus transmission is 1% to 1.8%. So at the end, what should be done as a post-exposure profile access to HBV and HCV will also be discussed in this video. Now, uh, before getting into the actual PEP regimen which contains antiretroviral drugs, it is very important to mention the first aid measures like what to be done when there is a risk or an exposure, right? So in that sense, if there is exposure to the skin, if, there, if the skin is pierced by needle stick or any sharp instrument, in that scenario, we should immediately wash the wound and also the surrounding skin with the help of water, okay? And also soap, we have to rinse it. Scrubbing is not recommended and uh, no need to use antiseptics or skin washes or bleach, chlorine, alcohol or betadine. No need to use all these things. A mere use of water and soap will suffice. And do not put this finger reflexly into the mouth. Okay, because that will increase the rate of exposure. Now, apart from the skin, even mouth is getting involved. The mucosal membrane of the mouth is getting involved. Now, if there is a splash of blood or body fluids, in that sense, we have to wash the area immediately. There's no need to use antiseptics. Now, I Irrigate the eye, exposed eye immediately with water or normal saline. The same thing is mentioned here. But one, one important point is, if you are wearing a contact lens, do not remove it immediately. Leave it in place. Because the contact lens act like a protection. After irrigating the eye, after finishing off the first aid process, then you can remove the contact eye, wash it and reuse it again. But immediately after the splash of body fluid to the eye, do not remove the contact eye because contact lens they act as protection right mm -hmm. and in the mouth yes we, if any fluid is uh, spilled into the mouth we have to spit it out immediately we have to rinse the mouth thoroughly with water or saline okay you have to repeat this process several times there's no need to use soap or disinfectant in the mouth so these are the first aid measures for management of exposure site okay we're discussing the site of exposure 
the next thing is the pep administration or the drug see what what is the usual practice if there is if there is a mere exposure risk exposure risk if there is an intern who is coming to you immediately like within 30 minutes of getting exposed you can start you can start post exposure prophylaxis immediately then do the risk assessment okay so in either case irrespective of the exposure status or the source status it is it is important that you start pep regimen immediately at least the first dose then you do the risk assessment based on the risk assessment if it turns out to be of low risk or no risk then you can stop the pep regimen okay so and it is very important that within two hours the process should be initiated if it is more than 72 hours it is not at all useful or least useful so it should be within 72 hours but ideally within two hours of the exposure now two main factors help in determining the risk of infection one is what type of exposure it is and what is the hiv status of the source patient whether he is hiv positive if it is, if he is hiv positive whether it is symptomatic or asymptomatic what is his cd4 count good or bad so based on those factors the risk of infection is determined now what are the different categories of exposure it can be a mild exposure moderate exposure or severe exposure Mild exposure is just exposure to mucous membrane or non-intact skin with very small volumes. And if there is a contact with the eyes or mucous membranes or subcutaneous injections, then it is mild exposure. What is moderate exposure? Moderate exposure is exposed to mucous membrane with large volumes or percutaneous superficial exposure with a solid needle. What is a severe exposure? Severe exposure is yes, there is large volume, but you have a high caliber needle here, which is actually contaminated with blood. If the wound is very deep, Okay, and if it is entering through IV or intra arterial route, then it is very severe exposure. Now, what are the categories of HIV status? HIV status it can be negative, it is low risk in the sense clinically asymptomatic, high risk in the sense clinically symptomatic. If the patient is clinically symptomatic, the risk is very high. But we won't be giving PEP regimens based on this degrees or categories of exposure and source. We will be looking at the coding, exposure codes or we call it as EC. Whenever there is a material with the blood, <coughs> bloody fluid or any potentially infected material which we already discussed in the initial part of the video. If there is a contamination with these things, if there is exposure to these body fluids, you have to see what type of exposure might have occurred. If the exposure is to mucous membrane or skin, which integrity compromised that is skin is open or if there is any wound in that scenario you have to check the volume of the fluid which got exposed if it is very small volume if it is only few drops for short duration we gave a code number ec1 okay exposure code number one if it is large volume and if there is a major splash for longer duration in that code the code is exposure code 2 or ec2 if the skin is intact, there is no PEP required. You don't need to worry about all this coding. But if there is skin is breached or if the exposure is to the mucous membrane, then based on the volume, you have exposure code 1 and 2. If the exposure is not to the skin or mucous membrane, if it is percutaneous, that means a needle stick injury, in that scenario, the severity is decided based on the nature of the needle. If it is solid needle, if the prick is less severe, if it is just a superficial scratch, then we put it under exposure code 2. If the injury is very severe, that means if there is a <coughs> hollow bore needle, if the injury is very deep, then we give exposure code 3. So we are done with the discussion of HIV exposure codes. What are the three exposure codes we have? EC1, EC2, we have two categories in this and EC3. Now what is the source code? Why it is important? Because based on the exposure code and source code, we will decide whether to start PPA prophylaxis or not. So in that sense, source code based on the HIV status of the source. If it is negative, it's like there's no need of PEP. But if the status is unknown, we call it as HIV SC. Now if the status is unknown, we have to take help of an expertise, infectious medicine specialist who has a uh, lot of experience with handling these kind of cases, we have to contact them. But at a primary level, by NACO to a PHC uh, doctor, I think knowing about the HIV positive status is more vital because based on that, you can decide on post-exposure profile access. If the titers are very low, if the exposure is asymptomatic, if CD count is very high, in that sense, 
we give a source code as one hiv source code one but if the titers are viral titers are very high exposure there is advanced disease and cd4 count is low when the count is low so the patient is prone for opportunistic infections immunity is very low he will transmit disease in a severe fashion so in that sense your source code is two so source code one and source code two now based on this exposure and source codes let us decide whether to give pep or not so these are the recommendations given by naco exposure code 1 and source code 1 there is no need for pep if you just remember this remaining all the combinations it is either recommended to give pep or if the status of the hiv of the patient is unknown the source is unknown you have to think about the prevalence consider pep if hiv prevalence is high in the community okay this naco guidelines are for rural areas or underdeveloped parts of the nation but if you take any developed nation if there is no burden on the health facilities irrespective of the exposure code and source code most of the interns they finish off their 28 days of post exposure prophylaxis because you cannot take a choice or chance in resource poor states or resource poor countries these kind of algorithms work okay if there is no or uh, lack of drug availability or if there is no financial constraints i think it is better to give anti rabies prophylaxis better to give hbv prophylaxis better to give hiv prophylaxis because it doesn't harm unless there are some adverse effects associated with the drugs it is better to give or complete the pvp prophylaxis so whenever you get any guideline from any national institute it is actually referring to the resource poor nature of the society okay so i think you have to keep that in mind and in any case of sexual assault okay the final one is if there is any case of rape victim who is sitting in front of you pep should be given because you don't have to wait for the hiv status of the accused there because that will take time the process and all immediately start the pep in a case of sexual assault now finally what are the drugs which we use pep regimens they tend to change 2014 it is different in harrison it is mentioned different in naco guidelines it is mentioned because the drugs they evolve the new drugs will come so based on the side effects and all so whenever you are in doubt it is always it is always important even in the guidelines by national aids control organization also they mentioned that when you are in doubt consult a specialist infectious medicine specialist so in that sense the drugs might change but the prototype drugs which are given as per 2021 guidelines are it is based on the age of the patient if the age is more than 10 years so in adults and if the weight is more than 30 kg the recommended the recommended drugs preferred regimen is tenofovir lamivudine and dolutegravir okay these are the three drugs which should be given the dosages are mentioned here there are alternate dosages just go through them but try to remember this preferred regimen okay for adults children it depends upon whether the age is between 6 to 10 years or weight is between 20 to 30 kg or age is less than 6 years or weight is less than 20 years because then the uh, dosage depends upon the weight band in these kids the dosage depends on the weight band and the drugs also change the drugs are zidovudine plus lamovudine plus dolutegravir here and zidovudine lamivudine lopinavir here okay the dosage should be based on that in special situations if there is anemic situations then instead of zidovudine we all know right zidovudine causes the bone marrow suppression and anemia in anemics we have to change it to abacavir so that is what is mentioned here and the pep regimen should be given for 28 days as i told you in the initial part of the discussion whenever there is a hiv exposure there is a subsequent risk of contacting even hbv and hcv right you also need to know the status of the patient for hbv and hcv so when you are posting any patient for any surgery we do these uh, things we or uh, we do tests for hiv hbv and hcv okay to prevent all these uh, uh, transmission of infections now if the patient is never vaccinated with hbv i'm so sorry if if the doctor or a nurse, the exposed person is never vaccinated with HBV, you have to give complete HBV vaccination series for three, right? There are three doses. If he is vaccinated and if the status of anti-HBS is known, anti-HBS, and if it is vaccinated within less than five years of less than five years ago, and HBS AG, anti-HBS AG status is known and the levels are more than 10 international units per limit. In that scenario, there is no need to give booster dose or no need to repeat the vaccination. But if the status is unknown, even if he is vaccinated less than 5 years ago, give a booster dose. Similarly, max vaccinated more than 5 years ago, you don't have to check for anti-HBS levels because already 5 years have passed by, you have to give a vaccine booster dose. Whatever HCV, 
hepatitis C virus. There is no vaccine for hepatitis C virus. There is no post-exposure prophylaxis drug for hepatitis C virus. You have to follow up the patient and you have to detect the early development of cirrhosis or liver cancer and you have to manage the case accordingly. Okay, so there is no post-exposure prophylaxis or no vaccine for hepatitis C virus. HBV virus treatment or management depends upon the vaccination status and also the years which are passed by. And HIV, our topic of discussion, we do know it in detail based on the source code and exposure code what are the recommendations of NACO 2021 guidelines so this will conclude our discussion on post exposure prophylaxis of HIV